Hi, Dan. Welcome to the show. Hi, John. Glad to be here. Yes, it's nice to have you here. Now, I noticed uh, earlier you something wrong with your hands. What, ha what happened to your hands there? Uh, my dog, I got between my dog and a piece of meat. Wow. Why? It must have been a nice piece of meat. I, I hope you didn't get too many stitches. Uh, they, won't, well, they won't stitch dog wounds because they're worried about infection. Jeez, well, I'm, I'm hoping the best for you. Thank you. Now, we're going to be covering two books that you've written and one that's just about to come out. And we're recording this in early March. So possibly by the time it, it gets to uh, YouTube, it'll already be out. And I'm looking forward to hearing about that one, too. But before <laughs> we get to your books, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, some backstory, who you are. And uh, when did you start writing books and what made you do it? Well, I started writing when I was 11 and uh, a teacher liked my story. And so... Uh, I've gone, done any kind of writing you can imagine. And then I decided, uh, once I left the phone company, that I actually had the time to, to devote to writing a full-scale book. So uh, that's when uh, 2019, eight years after leaving the phone company, I wrote uh, um, Capitalism Killed the Middle Class. Okay, so that'll be the, the first book we're going to cover. Uh, let's yeah. talk about that. The title is fascinating, and um, I've always been interested in that aspect. So that's your nonfiction book. Tell us uh, all about that one. Well, that was meant as a legacy to the labor movement, of which I've been involved for over 40 years as a union president. As a, Now I'm head of the book division for the National Writers Union. So uh, we try to promote our members, of course, and I'm going, I'm digressing on that. But uh, capitalism came about because, like I said, I wanted to leave something to the labor movement. And believe it or not, once you get to a certain age, all they're expecting to hear from you is reminiscences. And they're not looking for any kind of bold leadership at this advanced stage of life. Uh, so I decided to write it down so you'd have to listen to me, damn it. <laughs> and uh, I've been told that everything, everything in there is... Um, um, there's more than, like the subtitle says, 25 ways the system is rigged against you. There's a lot more than that, and I think uh, I need to write a sequel to include all the others. I look at the United States, and I see uh, the polariz polarization that everyone else sees. And yet, regardless of what side I'm on, and I think I'm on the right side, um, the other side, sometimes I have sympathy for them, because... They're just complaining about what's wrong with the world. Do you see some connection between what you wrote about capitalism and the problems facing the United States with this polarization? I think the polarization is actually a, a um, uh, it's like, it's just, it's deeper than that. The polarization is just the outward manifestation of this whole uh, um tendency to not connect with one another anymore and i think a lot of part a lot of that was due to uh, in part uh the uh the covid lockdown because i think we became uh those connections between and bonds between friends and neighbors and all that uh were not there for the longest time so we didn't have that built-in support network that we were used to and i think we forgot our social skills during that time so thanks thanks only got worse well, that's for sure. What I was referring to is them wanting to make America great again, as if, you know, there's some period in history that it was better than it is now. There's always been problems. And I personally think capitalism is at the, is at the root of those problems, regardless of which side of the political spectrum you're on. That's just my opinion. That's what I was referring to. Ah, uh, yeah, that is a, a very big problem. Used to be the Democratic Party was for the little guy, but... Uh... They found it real easy to belly up to the trough and have their share. So uh, I think that we probably need some kind of movement from within. It's going to, let me give you an example. I was a, um, I was running for a position within uh, one of the caucuses of the, of the state Democratic Party, of the Progressive Caucus, of course. And uh, I had this plan where we would put progressive people into positions of leadership of all the other caucuses. It would be a bloodless coup. But people didn't seem to 
had that same vision. So, uh, but I still think it could work. I think that's the way that you get organic growth and, and organic changes by doing something that uh, you have to play the long game sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in your book you cover this. So what's your personal feeling about capitalism? Uh, I think that it needs, uh, like it was in back in FDR's day, uh, a lot more robust oversight from government because uh, when you allow an agency or a, co a corporation to govern itself, more than likely they're going to cut some corners, whether it be health and safety of their workers, um, inferior uh, product, all those kinds of manifestations are um, because they're succumbing to the uh, uh, what's at the core of capitalism, which is greed. Yeah. So I read somewhere once, and I don't know the actual facts, but about 50 years ago, the difference in wages between the CEO of a company and the lowest rung worker was not as wide as it is today. Now it's completely out of control. And so therefore the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Yeah, I think the figure, uh, the disparity now is about 650 times. So it's peak time, I guess. And uh, that's just, that's uh, a friend of mine who's a real capitalist said that uh, if you're making that kind of money, you can spare another million dollars to your workers and you'll still be just fine. And uh, they, we seem to have forgotten this. It's a race to uh, a race to what? I don't know because we we'll all end up dead. But uh, a race to uh, have the most, I guess, like yeah. Mr. Musk or Mr. Gates. Hmm. Maybe it's just about power. Well, that's part of it because you look around and you're making as much money as you possibly can. What else? What other world is there to conquer? Power. Do you cover taxes and, and how they play a role in this greed? Uh, yeah, the, my next to last chapter is called Death and Taxes. Uh, but mostly I talked about the death tax that uh, rich people are so inflamed over because uh, they want to be able to have their tax cuts. And, and it, I guess it caps at a certain point. So um, and that way we get to save our money, poor people. But uh, I, I tr tried to cover that uh, in, to some extent, but uh, uh, it really is going to require some revision. And uh, some uh, a part to us, uh, as I was uh, not half jokingly about, but I think that we can. Uh, uh, I want to put a whole section in there about the banks. I, I covered the banks somewhat, but uh, not enough to, uh, in my opinion, to really expose them for what's going on. The whole uh, Fed not being part of being a private corporation. I I think I left that out. And that's a real important point about how the the money is manipulated uh, with those that uh, have access to it. When was the book published? It was published in 2019, so it is about time, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Now, what are sales like for that book since then? Well, in the total of time I've had, uh, since publish, publishing, I've uh, garnered about uh, 420 uh, purchases. And then there's copies I also gave out to folks. Gave one to Bernie's, Bernie Sanders' wife. I gave one to mm. uh, head of the AFL-CIO. And uh, haven't heard any calls yet, though. Mm. Sounds good. That's your nonfiction book. But then you decided to write a fiction book. And uh, from the description you uh, gave me when you first contacted me, <laughs> uh, sounds fascinating. And I thought, wow, you just turned a corner and did something totally different. Tell us about that book. You Will Forever Be My Always was developed by, from a phrase that uh, a romance writer in India was using. She had coined it. I walked into Home Goods one day and I saw so many things with those words on it. You Will Forever Be My Always. I said, what, what does that even mean? And I said, I know. I'll make it mean what I want it to mean. So I wrote this book. We were in the midst of a COVID lockdown. I had nothing better to do than come out to my office every day and write. And so at the same time, I was also looking into advancing my Parkinson's disease to see what I could expect coming down the road. And so I sort of put the two together and decided to write this book. It was this uh, obnoxious man who who tries to find uh, uh, f forgiveness and uh, some peace at, at the end. Mm. 
Okay. And he goes to uh, Thailand, I, I, I see here. and uh, yeah, Thailand and Morocco. Uh, his wife said he's been packing for a while. And so he goes to visit some friends in Thailand. And he has a near-death experience. And so he decides he wants to learn more about religion to see what if any can save him. So he talks to a, a Buddhist monk who's actually an American there, sort of dipping his toe in the waters. Uh, and then there's a uh, Catholic priest who's uh, Thai. And he talks to about it and he decides he doesn't like their answers. So his wife's not ready for him to come home yet. So he goes to Morocco. His friend's a devout Muslim. So he asks him about the Muslim way of, of making amends. And then he also runs into some, uh, there's a whole Jewish community in Morocco that nobody hardly knows about that uh, has been thriving there for hundreds of years. And uh, so I, he talks to them too about uh, considering the fact that he's Jewish, that's his faith. He thinks that uh, talking to these people that are from, from the same faith but a different environment, they might have some insight, which of course he doesn't think so. And I've actually been talking to a company about turning this into a TV series. Well, you mentioned that you have Parkinson's. Um, yeah. I guess I guess you're writing what you know then. Pretty much, and, and maybe uh, uh, learning it along the same path as my reader. Does the spiritual journeys play a big role then? Uh, towards the end, it's just about him and his uh, usual vain self. And uh, he, he stays essentially the same person all the way through, even though he tries to change. Okay. Well, I take it you're not the, uh, the same kind of character as in, in the book, because you mentioned he's a bit of an asshole. So I'd like to believe you're not <laughs> that, but... Um, how about, your spiritual, how, how about your spiritual journey during this time? I grew up Pentecostal and Southern Baptist. I even considered at a very young age of maybe uh, becoming a preacher. But um, then I, I started seeing the hypocrisy in the organization that I was involved in, in the, within the church. And uh, my, uh, my mom said to me at the age of 12, you, you've you've uh, matured enough to where you can find your own uh, way to the light. So uh, pick, uh, go ch try some other religions and see if one of them works for you. So I went to a Catholic uh, school. They call it catechism. And uh, uh, that didn't interest me. And the Assembly of God, where they did me do, had me doing lots of paperwork. It felt too much like uh, homework. And I had enough of school. So I didn't uh, latch onto that one. It wasn't until I was 19, seven years later, that I, uh, that Buddhism walked into my life. So I've been a Buddhist pretty much since then. Uh, maybe not a practicing one, but I still identify with it. When are you planning to have your third book come out? It should be out by the end of this week. I think they're posting it to Amazon. Okay. So we're talking After March, March of 2024, or mid March of 2024, and like I yes. said, by the time this airs, it'll already be out. Now, let's hear all about that book. <laughs> uh, this um, character named uh, Adolf um, Wallace, who was president and wants to be president again, uh, rigs the election and decides that he's going to declare um, martial law around the country. So he does that, and the American Indians decide that it's time to fight back, and they uh, they try to organize all the tribes and, and uh, to... Uh, to turn, turn things right again. And there's all sorts of twists and turns in it. I call it a, uh, a, a satirical thriller. Hmm. And somewhat speculative too. It's, uh, I think I think I know what you're alluding to. And um, <laughs> you know, if you want to get into a little deeper in the, in the story, uh, again, I'm curious to see what find happens in the end, but that would be giving away the end, of course. Um, there's, do, things, do, do, things, do, do things go from bad to worse in that book? Uh, yes, they do. Very, but, oh, but then towards the end, there's some redeeming stuff. So uh, I, I hope the ending sounds as plausible as it did in my head. Hmm. But it's up to my readers, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's two atomic bombs in it. There's an EMP. There's uh, all sorts of battles between uh, cowboys and Indians. <laughs> and wow. uh, and a lot of mean bikers, so uh, it's uh, 
It just keeps moving. Bit of a dystopian uh, theme going on there. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'm worried that, uh, like a lot of Americans, that it won't be so dystopian. Well, it will be dystopian, but it'll be a dystopian reality rather than just something I dreamed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been hard to keep up with reality. <laughs> it is, and it's uh, it sometimes doesn't seem very real, but it is. Yeah. So now, do you do any book fairs or, or book signings or anything like that? Uh, Capitalism killed. No, oh, that wasn't that one. Uh, it was a novel. It was just uh, presented at the Taipei Book Festival. I'll be signing copies of my books at the LA Times Festival of Books on April twenty first and twenty second. No, twentieth, twenty first. Okay. Now, uh, uh, is that the book that's got an audio book as well? No. Uh, both books do, and uh, there's one coming out on the uh, um, worst case scenario book, and that's being narrated by a guy named Adam Klugman. You may have known his dad, Jack Klugman. Okay, all right. Well, uh, how did you um, manage to do that? I guess it costs money to have to pay an actor to to do the work. Well, actually, there's this website that uh, a lot of people use that uh, where you can actually audition people online. And then send them some of your own copy from your book or whatever to read, so you know until you find the voice you want, and then you make them an offer. And uh, they have posted things on there so much per hour of recording. And there's other ones that say they'll do it for just um, royalty share, and there's other ones that uh, uh, make a sort of hybrid deal between the two. Okay. And uh, very fortunate, this is his first book, so he's cut me a deal. Oh. You and I are not that different in age. Uh, isn't it amazing the things that are available now? Like even like twenty years, twenty years, certainly thirty, thirty years ago, this none of this existed. I know. And here we are. It, it, it was right here in front of you. Right. right. Here. Yeah. And uh, I'm amazed how many books were written during COVID. <laughs> like so many of my authors. Including really? myself, I started writing uh, my fiction in in uh, 20, 2020. Oh, very good. Yeah. Is this your first book? I've written six books, but uh, the first two were nonfiction, which was pre-COVID, and then COVID came around, and I really wanted to write this story I've been meaning to do, and it turned into a trilogy. And it was meant to be a you know one one off, but it just it turned into a trilogy because COVID just kept going, so I just kept writing. <laughs> very good you used your time well yeah there's a lot of us like that yep do you have a website yes it's uh one of those bitly things what's on your website uh my first two books i haven't got my third one up there i haven't put the cover up there and i really should mm -hmm. it's not real crazy about the cover but it'll sell books i think yeah <laughs> any in the airport uh bookstores so where where are your books um available pretty much anywhere i go through a, a, a for um a company called ingram sparks that does print on demand so uh you can go just your local bookstore even and uh, they'll be able to to uh, get a copy of it and i've uh, sold books in uh, the u.s as well, in uh, thailand and uh uh australia so um i know that they uh, are available good good any final words you want to say about your work? Uh, let's see. Um, no, it's, it's just uh, it's uh, something I should have done a long time ago. And now I feel like there's this expression date on my forehead and I need to write as much as I possibly can. Oh, my next book after this one is called uh, Leonard Comes Home. That's about Leonard Peltier. And uh, I know his youngest daughter. And, and I said, how about I write a book? It's it's been 20 years since the last one came out. And she said, sure. So what I tried to do was make this one um, a story about uh, the man rather than the killer that the FBI paints him as, but somebody with all his faults and his, uh, uh, his good heart and uh, write about uh, that man so that uh, I guess I could say the book was written for President Biden because he has the power to give him executive clemency. He's been in there for 48 years after being framed by the FBI for the killing of two agents. Yeah, I'm familiar with the story. 
I just haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about it for so long. It's it's an interesting idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dan, I guess this comes to the end of this episode, and it's been really nice talking to you. Very good, thanks. All right, you take care of yourself now, Dan. You too. Take care. Thank you for watching. If you like what I do here on Tell Me About Your Book, then please consider hitting that like button and leaving a comment. You can also subscribe and ring that bell because I release two episodes per week, one on Wednesdays and one on Saturdays. And if you are an author, I would love to hear from you. Until such time, keep on writing and be kind to one another.